Welcome to The Potting Shed, the new weekly series brought to you by Reading Fringe Festival in partnership with BCA. I'm Chris Lambert, horticulturist and lecturer here at BCA, and thanks to all of you who've sent in your questions so far. This week we're talking carrots, weeds and pests. Emma from Woodley has said, how can she tell when her carrots are ready for harvest? Now often carrots are hard to see if they're ready for harvesting or not, as the leafy tops do not always indicate the size of the roots below. Carefully remove the soil from around the tops to expose those roots so you can judge the girth and see whether they're ready to harvest. Thinning out your crop at this time due to overcrowding is also a good way to see their development, as well as getting a quick baby carrot snack. Now be careful of carrot flies at this time who are attracted by the smell of those carrots. Best cover the old carrots afterwards as well. Now remember you don't need to harvest all your carrots at once. In good conditions they keep better in the soil than in your fridge. And with most cultivars taking two to three months to mature, the key thing here is patience. Michelle from Brighton is having an issue with weeds on her allotment and in particular hogweed and hedge bindweed. Now weeds are a big problem at this time of year as most fast flowering annuals have already spread their seeds and it's now the time that the bigger perennials are now muscling into those gardens and allotments. It's perennials such as hogweed and bindweed that have such deep tap roots that need constant work to make a dent in their growth. Now cutting back any visible growth and removing as much of the root as possible is a starting point, but even the smallest piece of root will see a return of this plant Lazarus. Now though your bindweed does not have many redeeming features, the hogweed is fantastic for pollinators and most plants are even edible with a root that actually tastes like parsnip. They don't eat any of those parts raw. Now another method to reduce the vigour of these plants would be to encourage other plants to compete with these brutes and also avoid leaving any areas of bare soil where weeds will happily colonise. Regular work will eventually weaken these plants, but most gardeners reach for the chemicals well before this. But remember, we should avoid chemical usage as much as possible owing to its effects on biodiversity. Now Michelle had heard that vinegar might be a good alternative. However, standard household vinegar has not been proven very effective, I'm afraid. Acetic acid, which is part of that vinegar, is often marketed as horticultural vinegar. And it is available and effective, but please be very careful with using it, as it is of a higher concentration. And though it may sound it, this is not a registered organic herbicide alternative. A note here for Linda from Caversham, who's also having some issues with some suspected weeds. The ones growing wild in your borders are Canadian fleabane, which are best removed now before they form their plentiful wind dispersed seeds. The one in your pot is a sow thistle, which again needs removal ASAP. Now remember everyone, a weed is only a plant in the wrong place. Now Linda has also had a pest problem, with red lily beetle eating her lily's leaves. She asks if it will still flower, and the answer is probably yes, but the plant is weakened and as such the blooms may suffer. Now any pest that heavily defoliates a plant that destroys its leaves will reduce that plant's ability to photosynthesise and therefore recover. Always remove as much of the pest as possible by hand before grabbing any pesticides. Megan has got in touch about her pest problems with aphids. She has acknowledged defeat this year after trying a range of approaches with little success and asked what she can do to prevent them from returning in such high numbers next year. Now, aphids are particularly common on a wide range of plants at this time of year as they suck the sap from that lovely new growth. And quite often natural predators do arrive to quell the marauding armies, but well after the damage has been done. Megan has made good use of natural predators such as ladybird larva, but these are never as effective outside of a greenhouse as quite often they just up and leave overnight despite the aphid smorgasbord provided by you. Our main issue this year has been the mild wet winter, which failed to kill off the aphids as they overwinter as eggs or adults on various shrubs. So check your nearby shrubs as temperatures fall and use a winter tree wash to help kill them off. Now pests prefer warmer weather for breeding, so timing of pest control is essential. Next year, once average temperatures reach about 10 degrees C, you can start to make use of the same techniques that you used this year spraying with soapy water and removal by hand. If you do this just as you start to see one or two aphids on your plants in March, then results should be much more effective. 
Now, interestingly, nearly all aphids that you'll see during the spring will be female, who are able to produce offspring parthenogenetically without the need for males. This means that just one aphid holds the potential for many more clones of itself, which is why getting started earlier in that season is best. That's it for this week. Thanks ever so much to everyone who's written in. If you have a question for me, email it to chrislambertgardening at gmail.com. And remember to check the Potting Shed page on the Reading Fringe Festival website for details. Thanks, and I look forward to seeing you back here next time. Mm -hmm.